Welcome to the Love Lessons Podcast, a space for you to invest in your most important relationships 20 minutes at a time. Today, I sit down with the Executive Director of Fusion USA, Miriam Swanson, to discuss all things relationships and holiness. Miriam, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Miriam, um, tell me, because about eight years ago, mm. there was a, you made a discovery linked to kind of your ministry and relationships that's kind of like changed the shape of how you have approached everything since. Yeah. Just tell us what that is and let's unpack that together. Yeah, we were talking about the word holiness and um, at the moment it seems to be talked about quite a lot, but about eight years ago I hadn't actually ever heard a talk on it. But what happened was uh, I had a little student mission team and we went away on like an away day and a retreat day and we spent some time just listening and praying and basically saying, what does revival look like? Like if God actually moved in this generation, if he actually poured out in a very noticeable, profound, different kind of way, what does that look like? Because if, if, if Jesus can do all that we ask or imagine, I can't actually imagine it, so I don't even know what to ask for. So we sort of had a go at imagining together. Um, and then our team came up with this sort of image of students just connecting and holding hands in circles upon circles upon circles and coming to Jesus through relationships and through friendships and through connection to connection to connection. No, it, we didn't actually have any sort of sense of front-led, one voice, everybody streaming to the front for something, actually quite the opposite, sort of pouring out, a spreading out, a connecting, connecting, connecting. And then the other word we got was holiness. And this was going to be a move that was marked by holiness. And we don't know what that word means. So at this point, I'm like, right, well, let's go and do some research. And then I was studying theology at the time. And one of my lecturers at the time, uh, Dr. Calvin Samuel, he uh, turned out his like, life's work was holiness, which is quite bold to say that's your life's, like, the thing you're going to talk about with your life. I'm like, it's quite dangerous in some ways. But um, he did this whole lecture on holiness and about how holiness was the transformative presence of God that marks people, and we become more like Jesus as we touch holiness, rather than holiness is the thing we've got to be afraid of and protect. It's transformative. And then, like, the penny dropped, and I'm like, okay, a move of God in this generation is going to be marked by the presence of God and the people of God connecting more and more people to the goodness of Jesus. And, of course, the first name of the Holy Spirit is holy. It's going to be marked by holiness, the transformative presence of God in people. And so we started going around the country, and in our sort of churches that reach students, we were like, we've got to talk about holiness everywhere we go. So it's, it's like so confirming to now know that is like a normal word current, currently in church culture when we think about a move of God and think about how we want to love one another really well. Because when we were first talking about holiness, I literally had leaders sort of in my parents' age group say, C could you not speak on that? Can you change the word? I actually had one senior leader say, could you use a different word because holiness has so much baggage? And that actually helped us also work out what's the baggage because I'd never heard a talk on holiness, not in the church streams I'd been in, which meant I actually didn't have the baggage about it. So I actually had to find out what was the baggage of purity culture that I'd put off the previous generations that mean nobody touched the word holiness, nobody mentioned it, and then we rediscovered it as something different. So it's been a really interesting journey of working out what it really means today. And um, what is that baggage? What was the baggage linked with kind of purity culture? Yeah, so my, my lecturer at, um, at college, he'd, he was from Antigua, and he was like, look, where I came from, girls weren't allowed to wear trousers, uh, boys and girls weren't allowed to be near each other, you weren't allowed to dance with each other, there was all these rules around distance to protect and safeguard yourself from other people and from... Um, safeguard your purity and um, and even in the south in America when I s spoke to some America pastors about this they've got this rhyme that's like um, don't dance no don't cuss don't spit don't chew and don't dance with the boys who do it's something like that don't smoke don't drink don't chew don't dance with the boys who do something like that right and I'm like okay oh, <laughs> you should see Yuli in England anyway um, <laughs> and then um, and I realized it's this, this baggage is around don't do that or this will happen as a consequence. And so the way that my lecturer described holiness in the purity culture movement had been basically, imagine there might be people here that are brave enough to be wearing white trousers, but imagine that you're wearing white trousers. If you think holiness 
is the thing that needs protecting at all costs. That the presence of God is so pure and fragile, it's like wearing bright white jeans. Then you really would think through where you sit down, not on a public bench without checking. You'd think about what you eat, definitely not spaghetti bolognese. You'd think about who you hung out with, not people messing about with paint. And in my case, I wouldn't even touch a biro because I just would inevitably drop it on myself. And so if holiness is the thing to be protected, of course you'd separate yourself from anyone that might look dirty, might be doing something that gets messy, and you'd avoid places where it could get a bit grimy and mess up your nice white jeans. If you think that holiness is the essence of the transformative presence of God, his name and his nature, because God says, be holy as I am holy, then think about holiness, this is what my lecturer told me, he said, think about holiness as being the bleach that made the genes white in the first place. Now that is a game changer, because instead of walking around going, I can't touch that, I can't sit there, I can't be near you, I can't eat with you, if you look at the sort of scriptures around who Jesus was or wasn't allowed to eat with according to the Pharisees, it's all, holiness is woven into the fabric of the New Testament stories of Jesus getting into trouble with religious leaders who really took serious holiness, holiness seriously as well. If holiness is the genes, you protect them. If holiness is the bleach, where does bleach work best? It works where it's needed most. It works when it's poured out to transform what was stained or what was dirty and made clean. So suddenly you go, well, where can holiness be? Anywhere. What can holiness do? Anything. How powerful is holiness? The most powerful thing, and that's why you lock it away. You lock bleach away in the cupboard because if that thing falls, it stains, it covers, it changes what it touches. If holiness is the transformative presence of God, where do you go? Nightclubs, stone cold sober with the presence of God for absolutely alive to what Jesus is doing in the room. Where do you go? You go with people that are covered in body paint. Why? Because I'm not afraid. It's not about my genes getting stained. It's about the transformative presence of God showing up and it making a difference where it's seen the most, which is where it's needed most. That is a game changer. That totally changes this purity culture thing of don't touch me so I don't sin. And it becomes how free can we get together? How clean can we get in the body of Christ? How, um, how distinctive can God look in the culture? Let's test it. Why? Let's go. Why? Because we're salt, we're light, we're holy. Be holy as I am holy. Game changer to mission. Game changer to relationships. So Miriam, how do you, how do you grow in it? So if it's, if it's the bleach... How do, you, how do you become more so, more holy, uh, have a greater impact? That's a funny one, isn't it? Because um, I'm certainly no expert on holiness. We just got told about it and so explored it and realized, oh, we should all know about this. Um, be holy as I'm holy. Who's holy? Jesus. How do we access Jesus now? How do we encounter more of who he is, get counseled and coached in his ways? understand his character and his power through his Holy Spirit given to us. So if I want to become more like Jesus, I, my, my heart is to become holy as he is holy. So I just want to hang out with my friend because he is transformative. His presence is holy, so his presence is transformative. So there is something to be said with just wasting time with the presence of God to work out what you like. It's your name, it's your nature to be holy. So I want to know your ways, Jesus. I want to know your tone of voice. I want to both understand you in scripture and have a go at living out what you've called us to live for. So, yeah, in many ways, holiness looks like genuinely trying to love and follow Jesus every day of your life with all that you've got. And that sounds, obviously, it's a very sort of easy sentence to say. But obviously, in practice, that means every day we're working out how my whole life makes him smile, how my whole life is worship to him. And then that's, that's as tiny and as beautiful as just genuinely loving your neighbor. Like just making eye contact and choosing to love your literal neighbors on your street. And that is as massive as being brave enough to invite the Holy Spirit to come and bring peace to a friend with anxiety because we believe the transformative presence of God is the thing that makes the difference. It's as hard as working out how to do times of quiet, times of intercessory prayer where you're really thinking beyond yourself and trying to get out of your own way to bless somebody else, to bless the nation. It's as hard as trying to read the Bible and discover Jesus in the pages, even on the days when you're tired or bored or overwhelmed or distracted. And it's as easy as walking down the street and going, I'm walking with Jesus today. So how do we walk together? Pay attention. 
What are you up to? How do I join in with what you're already doing in the world? So yeah, it's, n it's not a formula, but it is a person, and he does say that we can meet him and walk with him, and that he's given us all we need in his Holy Spirit. So I think that must help. And also with that, it feels like with kind of the purity culture movement, it was very much kind of like rules, like right. stop it, don't do that. And but yet, from what you're saying, it sounds like it's more birthed out of like desire. Mm. Is that right? Yeah, I think the tricky thing is, it like, and I don't want to just like throw the purity culture thing under the bus because um, it has, th there's, there's principles that I'm assuming the older generation was trying to instill in the younger generation for their benefit. Like it's not like we just made up rules. Like people genuinely were like, the best way you can love one another is to honor one another, to honor one another with your body and with your words and with your mind and therefore to respect one another, to respect boundaries, to respect um, to have clarity in relationships. I'm sure there was lots of sort of good values there. But I think the rules thing or the sense of don't do that, that or else stuff rather than do this because of who he is just meant that there was a sense of shame or hiddenness if inevitably you didn't get all the rules right. Whereas if holiness becomes an invitation to a transformative presence, then we are all ideally going from glory into glory, being transformed into his likeness as we pursue him. But it also basically is okay if my transformative journey with Jesus in this area of my life is starting way back there because it's more about the direction of travel rather than I did this or I didn't do this. And equally, I don't need to judge or if somebody's right up there, they're way further on than me around how they're handling social media really well. Instead of feeling like, oh, shame, like I'm not as pure as them around how I do my online life. Instead, I can be like inspired around the invitation. There's an invitation to more. More is possible with Jesus. So what does the more look like? You know, that's where accountability becomes freedom. Because if I say to a friend, I really respect how you do your finances, you're incredibly open, generous, and accountable about your income and your generosity. Like you're really thinking through how money doesn't have a hold, but how it's open in your hands like a river. Then actually, rather than being shamed, like, oh gosh, like, I'm really not that generous. I'm not giving regularly, certainly not to my local church. I'm a bit sporadic, not very prayerful. Not Instead of being like, I don't really want to talk about it. Instead, I'm like, show me how free you've got around money. Can I get free like that? Okay, let's go on that journey together. Like, I feel like holiness could be a posture of freedom rather than, like, restriction, feel a bit awkward, feel a bit shameful. Yeah. Save all with friendship. So let's, let's now apply the principle of holiness as the transformative work of God within a, a person. Ha, let's uh, apply that to a bit more to friendship. Mm. Um, so finances is one area. Are there other areas in which uh, the pursuit of Jesus, the pursuit of holiness, shapes the way that we do friendship, the way that we communicate, the way that we engage with um, mates around us? Yeah, I think it's a funny one, isn't it? Because you've got categories of friendship in, in the sense that um, you've both got your friends that are on the same journey as you towards Jesus, like very knowingly and choosing to try and work out how to follow him in the world today. And they're like your running mates. Um, we need them. Faith is, was never meant to be isolated. Like we're literally always placed in families, the body of Christ, other believers, siblings alongside us. So there's those mates. And then there's the sort of missional side of those that haven't yet discovered Jesus for themselves can taste and see something of the goodness of God by the presence of Jesus in us in the world, ideally. So for my sort of mates that know Jesus, I'm not like pursuing holiness with every one of them. That is unsustainable. Do you know, like you can't just the whole room, like let's all be accountable, shall we, to like a hundred people or something. But there are a few people where we've intentionally chosen I want you to become more like Jesus on my watch. Would you watch out for me in the same way? Let's go for it then. And then you basically have to commit to the eye-watering honesty of being brave enough to say the thing or to ask the thing, which could look as simple as asking the question, is there anything you don't want to tell me? So that you just dig shame out, call it a liar, put it in the light and work at it together. Or it could be as beautiful as you know, like one of my friends knows me so well now, she doesn't even need to ask. She can look at me and I'll tell her. She, and e even there'll be times when I'll text her when I'm trying to discern something. And she'll say to me, Miriam, if it's a question, you already know the answer. And it's true, there'll be some things where I'm like, is this okay? And she's like, because you've asked me, you know, if you were gonna go fully in on where your conviction is, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that, or you would do that. You would be brave enough to step out in that way, or you'd be brave enough to say no in that way. 
And so I've got a few friends where, because we've agreed we want to become more like Christ and we want to do it together, then our life is on limits, both to be prayed for, to be asked about, to explore. And that's such a relief because now I've got friends that I made at university and they're still the people that we'll like, we'll now wrestle through like parenting with, um, like marriage decisions with, that we at the time were wrestling through dating with and how to behave in a nightclub, how many beers is too many beers with. Like they're the same friends that in each season we're growing up together and hopefully growing deeper uh, with Jesus. So having a few running partners like that I think is vital for our faith. And I love with your definition of holiness, suddenly accountability actually becomes not just like sin prevention, like, oh, right. help me stop doing no, something. Gosh, no, gosh, It's actually like, are you, um, are you living the life that you were made to live? Right. Uh, like, are you, uh, is it a full life? Is it a fruitful life? Is it like, so it's, it's both not just stop it, but like, come on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, at university, I just started asking the question, how free can a person get? Like, if we're free in Christ, how free can you get? Like, what does freedom look like in every area? Now, I've obviously not got that down, and with every new season, new challenges come up where you're like, I didn't even know I needed to be free around that, but this is a new thing that I now have to sort of work through with Jesus and my friends together. But yeah, we started asking, our accountability started with how free can you get, and that posture is a game changer to then how you treat every category that otherwise you'd be like, right, let's go through the seven deadly sins. Instead, we're like, how free can you get around how you love people well? How free can you get how you pursue relationships well? How free can you get around money, work, um, performance culture? How free can you get around like honoring your parents but also knowing where you stand and like knowing your own boundaries stuff like that so it's amazing let's take um dating and freedom and holiness and um how do we get like freer in like our our dating kind of journey so for those listening who um single dating um actually looking for a partner um what does it look like to do that in like a, a holy um freedom seeking way and, and share a bit of your experience of that as well. Yeah, I think, again, I, I'm not an expert, but I've just got my story. And my, for me, um, I, I only got married at 31. So I actually spent my whole 20s um, following Jesus, trying to work out how to date, also in Christian leadership. I hadn't actually seen a woman do that before, like to publicly lead whilst also privately trying to date. <laughs> which is not actually that easy at times, it would seem. Um, and just working out how to, this is such a funny one, isn't it? Because I'm like, I take Jesus really seriously, but I also don't want to take myself too seriously. So also chill out, Miriam. You know, I had to spend a lot of time just being like, calm down. But holiness in dating, I think I, I began to realize I just wanted to have this attitude of whatever happens, I want to leave you better than I found you. So I'm going to honor you enough that if, if like, you know, classic situation let's say they're a friend but there's a little bit of a spark and you're just kind of wondering and you both decide this is quite brave to take a risk because you're actually good friends and it's a bit scary because friendship's gold and I hate the idea of the friend zone as if that's a demotion because friendship is like Jesus's top standard like he adores the greatest love you know greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends like holy friendship's amazing <coughs> But sometimes you're like, that could be something more, not sure what to do with that. And sometimes you decide to be brave enough to test that water. That is courageous. And so in an attitude of holiness, I want to treat you incredibly well, like my friend. I want to honor you like my brother in Christ. And I just want to ideally leave you better than I found you. Even though it's difficult today, it's difficult to then work out if it doesn't work. Like, I have plenty of those stories of going, ah, oh, this isn't it. So how do I respect you enough to communicate to you clearly and leave you better than I found you? That doesn't always mean it doesn't hurt in the moment. It doesn't always mean there aren't bits that are messy because people are messy and emotions are messy. But clarity is kindness, so communicating really clearly. Even just like saying to people like, ghosting is like the opposite of kind. Like it just is. Like have the, have the kindness and the courage to be clear because then people get to draw a line and they get to then lead their lives rather than be in a limbo of going, I don't know whether this is respectful to you or not to Karen for suing you, this is all murky. So where possible, a lot of my posture was just be clear, be kind, be brave. And I found that dating, you know, particularly when you get later into your 20s, it, it takes a level of courage and stamina to pick your heart up and try again. 
And don't get me wrong, there were seasons, years, when I felt like God just went, everything's a no, so just don't. And that takes some guts as well. If you get asked out by somebody you think, you're actually kind of brilliant, and you've been told very specifically, say no, that's, that takes faith. In my case, I literally felt that, and then um, I'm, I, th- I don't think this is like a, a story that always happens or anything, but I literally met my husband now, I didn't know that at the time, like six weeks later, and I was like, and at the time, I actually wasn't even interested in my husband because I felt like God had said no. So I was like, everyone is a no. So it took him four months of like contact before I was like, oh, you might be, yes. Um, <laughs> but just because I was so like, God said no, so it's a no. Calm down, Miriam, stop taking yourself so seriously. But do you know, like, um, having the courage to try and follow your discernment. And again, I would just say, I don't think it's really easy on your own to discern about romance. I don't think it's easy. I think you need community. And so I'd say for me, I, I lent into my friends hard in my 20s around helping me discern dating because I knew if I fancied them, then there were other emotions going on. So I just needed a couple of really good mates to be able to say, Miriam, by all means have a go, but I'm telling you now, he's not for you. <laughs> that happened. And then sometimes for them to go like, I know that you've written him off, but give it a minute. Which actually, in the case of my husband, he was like, his best friends were my friends. I just thought he was like best friend category. And then it was one of my best friends that said, you've actually, he's a different character than you've seen before, pay attention. Because uh, I think he's gonna bring out something really different and I think this is gonna be really good. And, and it was, my friends told me to pay attention and I needed the community discernment. So I would say, when you cultivate holy communities, they really help in those moments, they really do. Just something to um, notice and honor in what you've said, it's like, um, yes, you've got dating up here, but underneath you've built this kind of a connection and relationship with God, and also like an obedience to, right. to asking him and listening to his voice, and how have you cultivated that? Because like you say, it takes faith, take, took quite a lot of bravery to yeah. be like, no, 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 no. How did you cultivate that, like, that spiritual like, confidence in God to be able to do that, even though you know, I imagine you really desired to be with someone, um, but yet you said no. How, how did you build that obedience? Um, uh, just practice, honestly. So it's like, literally like um, strengthening a muscle in the gym. Just practice being a yes man or woman to God in lots of small ways all the time. So that instinctively, when a big way comes, it's not your first go of trying to hear his voice. And like, again, like I say, I d- it's not like I always dated well or heard his voice accurately. There were some people that I just, they were honestly just friends and... Um, and we had to sort of reconcile. We shouldn't have dated because we were just friends and let's like repair that. But um, just practicing on the little moments of obedience in any area of your life, all practices, but then some of the biggies. And some people, um, genuinely it is really clear. And I would say for me, in, in one sense, it was really clear in my 30s, but that's also because I was in my 30s. And so I know myself better by then. 21 year old Miriam, I'm going to tell you a few people I was going to marry in my head. (laughs) 31-year-old Miriam, I was happy to be single for the rest of my life, and I genuinely mean that, because I knew I'm not entitled to marriage. It's a a privilege, and it's hardcore. Like, it's tough and good. And therefore, um, it's not something I just expect. I might want it, or even have sensed that God said that would be part of my story. And I'd sensed that, and I decided not to hold it against God if it didn't happen. Because I also know there's loads of things that this side of heaven we don't see that we thought we were going to see. So I literally decided I'm going to work out the secret of contentment to live in community, to live and be a deeply loving friend, to help cultivate my friends' kids around me and be a brilliant godmum. And uh, if the marriage thing is something that is part of my story, so be it. But help me, Jesus, get that right. And by my 30s, I was just much more crystal clear around who I am, whose I am, what I'm about. And therefore, I was not looking to compromise. It was either the right guy or no guy, and that's absolutely fine. And that's how free can you get again? Because I wasn't crippled by, but I've got to be married. I'm like, no, that's not true. Jesus didn't die so I could have a husband. What a lame gospel. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Like, it's a bit shallow, isn't it? Like, wow. So, yeah. Um, Obedience, um, commitment. So he talks about freedom. And I think sometimes people think commitment is like the antithesis to um, commitment. Like, if you want to be free, then don't commit. Oh, sure. Say, s- say a bit, because you have now you have now committed to Ben. Yes. Um, uh, do you feel more free? 
you know, again, I'd say I learned this single way before I had to learn it in marriage, which then made the marriage thing, it's not scary to commit at that point because I know, I, I know boundaries bring freedom. So even in, in the Psalms, it talks about, the Lord says, the boundary lines and have fallen in pleasant places for me. Like God has put pleasant boundary lines for us. And so as a single person in my 20s, in a job that I could travel all over the country and sometimes all over the world, for me, I chose to limit myself so that I didn't end up isolated, independent, or selfish. And that takes intention. So I chose things like, um, I will always be in my local expression of the church and my local expression of a small group 50% of the month. That's because my job is working with churches, so I, could, I actually had to work with other churches. Do you know, I couldn't just like never visit another church. But I was like, I'm never gonna be away more than I am in my local. And then I set a boundary like, um, always making time for my friends, particularly ones that don't know Jesus. Um, always making time for fun, being as wildly generous with my salary as I can be, particularly when I don't have outgoings in the same way that someone with a mortgage and kids did because I was just renting in a tough bit of town so the rent wasn't very high. Um, I put all these limits in place deliberately so that I was an interdependent human as part of a community, as part of my neighbourhood, as part of my friends, as part of my church. So then when it came to marriage... I, do you know what? I even had seasons where I say to Jesus, like, give me something to lay my life down for because I'm actually scared about the level of freedom I could have in the world. Like, I could be really unaccountable if I'm unmarried, salary just to myself, traveling, whatever, meeting all these people. I was like, I've got to learn how to limit myself so that I grow deep, not just wide. And um, because sacrifice and laying down your life is a secret to the narrow way of the kingdom... So don't just take the broad highway just because I can speed wherever I like. Like, find the narrow way. And you have to find it. It's not just there. You know, Matthew talks about um, few find it. So I'm, like, searching for what is a way to stay deeply rooted in Jesus and his people. And so then, yeah, when Ben came along, it wasn't just like, oh, my word, what does it look like to suddenly share? No, we've been practicing sharing. Technically, I'm teaching my three-year-old how to share. I don't know why we stop as adults. Like, we've been practicing to share, ideally, our whole lives. But how do I live with a boy? I've lived in community. Like, okay, but, you know, how do I share finances? Like we did before with your friends and the church and those in need. So do you know what I mean? I'm like, none of this is explicit for, like, just for marriage. All of this is to be cultivated now. And then that helps the covenant moments, which legally are a bit more scary. But character-wise, that should just be calling on the stuff that's in you. So helpful, Miriam. Uh, Miriam, um, just as we wrap up, just anything kind of final you'd like to say to those um, listening linked to holiness relationships, any final bit of advice you'd like to, to give? Yeah, I would just say, if you're, if you're still feeling like um, I'm hiding how I'm feeling about relationships or I feel shame or I've just not got it right or that there's somehow something wrong with you and that's why this or this isn't working out, We've just got to name the lie because Jesus' invitation is get it all in the light. Firstly, it puts it all in perspective. Anything that you feel shame about relationships, you bang it in the light of Jesus and you suddenly see it for the size that it is. And it doesn't cast half such a big shadow as it did back there. Like, oh, that's actually very manageable in the eyes of Christ. Secondly, his holiness transforms what we bring in. So then bring your friendships, bring your family of origin and that mess of a story or joy of a story bring your hopes, dreams, or fears about marriage. See what the transformative presence of God does with it. And then invite a couple of mates to just come and look at it with you and say, how free can we get? How much can this taste and see of the goodness of God? Uh, and, I, and I would just say 100% hands down, whatever stage you're in, friendship, friendship, friendship. Like, learn to be best friends with Jesus. Learn to be best friends for yourself. Um, learn to love your neighbors and um, cultivate your friends because in and out of season your spouse will sometimes feel like your friend not your spouse in seasons and I'm like that is not a bad thing friendship it, with Jesus the Holy Spirit and like a part like even like your life partner like that glue keeps you together on the times when you're like in practical mode or someone's gone away or they're sick or things where you're like oh but the romance is there like it's not dead it's just in some seasons get that friendship glue with Jesus and you together get that glue because then, in and out of season, you love well, you stay kind, you stay clear, you stay 
in the light. So it's an invitation. Holiness is a good news invitation. And if you've heard otherwise, ask Jesus to, to reframe your mind on that because it's good news. Miriam Swanson, thank you very much indeed for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Love Lessons podcast. We'd love to encourage you to stay in touch through subscribing to our Relationships Roundup and following us on Instagram at Love Lessons London. And our encouragement to you is to keep investing in your most important relationships.